Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're doing a yet another episode of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights. We take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making, and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today we've got quite a lot of fish as you can see here, but we're ending off with a cool little bird that got a remake. But um, let's get stuck into this one, lots of leaf and buff zoo mods of course, so we're going to be starting off today with the... Kafui uh, killfish. I'm, I don't really speak uh, African or any language like Sahili, um, anything like that. I can't speak any African language well, so uh, that's my best approximation. But anyway, we've got the Kafui uh, killfish. Scientific name is Nothobranchus um, kafuensis, uh, described by Winkett and Rostock in 1989. Really, really interesting uh, species. So these guys are type of that group that. Um, uh, called Crinoptid uh, formies. So these guys are part of the killfishes, live bearers, and river lines. Uh, river lines, I believe you say that. And the, and the family is the Notobranchidae, which is the African version uh, part of that group. And the scientific name means uh, Northos, uh, means, means false in Greek, and Branchia means gill. So the name basically means the false gill, which is pretty interesting. They're really cool little guys here. So. These guys are bethnopelagic, so they're typically found in open, uh, deep water. And these are freshwater fish, you can only find them in freshwater. Um, they live in tropical waters from between 22 to 28 degrees Celsius. And they're typically African, so they can be found around the Kifuli River and Upper Zambezi River in Zambia. So a little bit of a restricted range there, but still really, really cool animals. So, in terms of their maximum length, they're quite a smaller fish. These guys get about 6 centimeters long, uh, or in, in their total length. And they're a bottom spawner, and they have about 5 months or so incubation. Let's see if we can find a little one hanging around here, different color, just to mix it up. So, um, yeah, really, really cool little fish. They are difficult to maintain in aquariums, though, though they can be found in aquariums. Uh, they're considered least concerned, so their species is not really considered, like, um, at risk of extinction or anything. But, um, yeah, they're obviously things such as habitat loss, oil spills, especially with the th stuff going on there with Vango Delta. If something like that happened in the upper Zambezi, that would be a bit rough. But generally, they are pretty harmless and quite common little fishies. And they are c uh, common commercially for um, the aquarium trade. But, yeah, it's just still really awesome little fish in general. I'm a big fan, so that was done by Leaf and Buff Zoo. Next one, we're moving on to a really, really cool little marine fish for a change. We've got a lot of marine fish this episode, which is pretty cool. We're going to have a look. This one is done by Leaf Buff Zoo and Printable Models. We have got the Golden Orange Lined Cardinal Fish, also known as the Yellow Striped Cardinal Fish or the Golden Striped Cardinal Fish. So really, really cool little guys here. Really, really awesome little fellows. So this little guy is uh, typically found in the Indo-Pacific area. Um, Indi or Indo-West Pacific, Indo -West Pacific. And they're off part of the group of the Cardinal Fish, which is a really cool group of marine fish. Their family name is uh, Pongidae. Uh, these guys, as you can see, they're typically like a s uh, bluish, silvery color with these orange-yellow stripes, as you can kind of see here. And they grow to an average length of about 6 centimeters or so. And they typically live in waters about 50 meters deep or so, or even less than that. The deepest you'll find them is about 50 meters. Often in places such as lagoons and coral reefs. Um, they're active during the night time and they feed on small plants and animals, but mostly plankton. And they have been quite a subject to uh, research to test what might happen to marine life by the year 2100 uh, due to the predicted carbon dioxide levels uh, in the atmosphere, which is pretty interesting. Um, as I mentioned, these guys, as large ones, they can get up to 8 centimeters, but average 6. They're covered with this. Um, Silver with a bluish tinge, and they have these six orange stripes going down the bodies and kind of see where they get their kind of get their name. Um, they're typically found around the Indo Pacific, they can be find, uh, found from the Red Sea east uh, in East Africa, east via Western Australia to Queensland, and then they can be found in New Caledonia and uh, north to the Ryukyu and um, on the Sawa Islands, I believe you say that. But they typically live in lagoons and shallow reefs for between 1 to 50 meters deep, an average about 15, 15 meters. And they typically make homes within ledges, holes, or even between the spines of sea urchins. And they tend to um, settle by... Uh, how they settle is tend to be by larval recruitment. But at least part of the uh, Great Barrier Reef, uh, at least one-third of the recruitment of the species is given 
uh, coral reef patch tends to be adults, so juveniles migrating across sand and coral debris, which is pretty cool. And in terms of diet, as I mentioned, there are nocturnal planktivores that typically emerge from their caves and crevices and just hover around the sandy microhabitats of coral reef flats, where they look for small things to eat, so like microplanktons, um, uh, copepods, things like that. And they held their, ha, ha, hold their mouth agape uh, when eating ethnic prey. And consuming this type, various type of prey, it gives them different shaped mouths with different variability. So you can kind of tell what they're eating just by the shape of their mouth, which is pretty cool. In terms of reproduction, these guys are paternal mouth brooders, so that means the males will hold their um, babies in their mouth. It's very likely the most important reason for the sexual dimorphism uh, shown by the male's wide gape and more protruding lower jaw is for that uh, than for prey specificity. So it's most likely the males have bigger mouths so they can hold the babies in them. Uh, the bigger mouth allows for more eggs to be produced by um, protected from predation and also have better water circulation for both the eggs and the parent, which is pretty cool. And pair bonding is, does not appear to uh, provide the extended genetic benefits of monogamy. And it seems like uh, many pair bonding fishes, predation uh, seems to be, uh, have driven it rather than reproductive um, exclusivity. So they don't really seem to have the genetic benefits of monogamy, but they still do it anyway. So they're definitely one of the best of us. So in terms of tourism, they can be visible uh, low on the reef during the daytime and then potentially oh, much common in the nighttime, especially in tropical countries. They're exported uh, for the aquarium trade and they often can benefit uh, uh, local conditions of places where people are poor or stuff like that, as long as it's done appropriately and it doesn't really take too much from the ecosystem. But um, they're also being used in laboratory experiments. Uh, to figure out what marine life uh, may happen to marine life by the year 2100, uh, given that the predicted uh, atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide are going up because of anthropogenic or human-driven climate change. Um, it appears to have a negative effect on the fish's metabolic rate and rate of survival uh, because ocean acidification causes extra carbon uh, dissolved and it also makes the water about an extra 3 degrees warmer, uh, which we can already kind of see today, which is a bit frightening. And uh, reef uh, fish populations are higher uh, in cooler latitudes, so they have more capacity to cope with these rising temperatures and acidification than the ones near the equator, which is a bit rough, but still really, really awesome little fishy here. I'm a big fan. Done by Leaf Buff Suit and Printable Bond Models, along with our next guy. This next one's also done by Leaf Buff Suit and uh, Printable Models. So we've got the Red Eye Rass. Oh, wrong uh, button there. Have a look at these cool little guys. So this is the Red Eye Rass. Uh, or their scientific name is Turiheburus um, soloriensis, I believe you say that. Um, they're a type of group there in the group of races, of course, and their group's uh, their genus name means uh, curious, uh, I mean furious um, curl fringe, which is a pretty interesting. Uh, these guys are typically marine fish, and they are found in uh, depths of about 5 to 35 meters down. And they typically live in reefs and stuff like that. So very similar habitats to kind of the cardinal fish. Uh, they're typically found at those depths. And they're quite tropical. These guys have a little bit more of a restricted range though. They're typically found in Western Central Pacific. So around Indonesia. Uh, those islands kind of like that. They'd be found in Northern Australia. Like uh, around Cape York. Things like that. Even in parts of um, Indonesia. Things like that's where they're typically found. They get a little bit bigger than those other cardinal fish. They get about 11 centimeters long in total length. And... Uh, these guys, in terms of their description, they usually have these really bright colors, and so this is kind of find uh, through breeding, but some populations actually have these permanent colors, so that's really, really cool. And there is um, some evidence of hybridization with other related species. Let's have a look at one swimming down here. Really, really awesome. So these guys are typically found in coastal to outer reef lagoons, and they can be found in rubble and coral kind of habitats. And they actually make uh, distinct pairings during breeding, so they... Let's see if we can find the way out. So they typically like to hang out and do their own thing and then make their own pairs when they're breeding. So um, they're considered harmless and they're not too common in the aquarium trade, it seems. And in terms of their conservation status, they are data deficient. So we really just don't have a good idea of their populations and monitoring to really make a judgment on their uh, common. But they seem to be wide ranging and seem to be doing all right. So that's kind of what we assume. So um, yeah, really, really awesome. Nice red eye raz. So next, we're going to be moving on to uh, another marine fish. We've got the white grouper. This one was done by Leaf Bofsu and uh, 3D Job Team. So another cool grouper. A grouper grouper. 
really, really awesome. Well, that's a bit of a, what happened to the other side, but anyway, really, really cool. Might have been a bit of a mess up in the model. He's got one fin. <laughs> but anyway, um, these guys are a type of marine ray fin fish from the subfamily Ephidophilidae, and they're part of the family that includes the Anathus and sea basses. And they're typically found in the subtropical eastern Atlantic and southern Mediterranean oceans. And you can kind of see they've got a wide head that's quite a bit longer than, uh, wider than that's, uh, longer than it's quite a lot, uh, quite, they have a head with a longer, um, that a body is deep, so they've got quite a long body. Uh, they also have these kind of large spines as well, and they've got the soft rays, which is kind of hard to see on the side for whatever reason. Um, the caudal fin, as you can see, is quite rounded and stuff like that, and they have over 90 scales over their lateral line. Uh, they are three to four blue to white lines across their gill covers you can kind of see here. And they also have these vertical bands going down their body. Their maximum length is about 60, uh, 120 centimeters or 47 inches. Although they're more commonly found to be about 60 centimeters or 24 inches. With a maximum published weight of about uh, 25 kilograms. So, um, yeah. They're typically found in the eastern Atlantic Ocean from southern uh, Portugal to southern Spain along with like the western coast of Africa and as far south as Angola. They can be found in the, uh, they believe to be found in the Canary Islands but it hasn't been verified. But yeah, they can be typically found in Morocco, things like that. There's also a uh, history of vagrancy in this species and there was a specimen actually found in Cornwall and southwestern England which is far outside their tropical normal range. Uh, which is pretty interesting. So these guys typically occur on substrates with rocks or mud or sand while they're juveniles. Uh, while the juveniles can be found in um, coastal lake lagoons and estuaries. The adults are typically found in these um, rock or mud sand habitats. And they can be found at depths between 220 meters. So quite a depth there from 66 to 665, uh, 56 feet. Um, they're a carnivorous species, very similar to other um, types of grouper. And they typically feed on things like uh, fish, somatopods, crabs, and cephalopods, where they typically just feed on what if they can. And they have a seasonal migration of the species from the coast of Sengal to Manitouria, which is believed to be uh, linked to the upwelling of the uh, coasts of these nations. And they're also um, polygynous hermaphrodites. So while females reach a sexual maturity at about uh, 50 to 60 centimeters long, or 20 to 24 inches, at the age of 5 to 7, they then change into a male, um, and then basically from five to seven years old, they're female. And then from 10 to 13, they are males. And of Tunisia, this species spawns between June and July. And while in the Estepic band in Turkey, these guys will breed between early June and up to August. So, um, yeah, they're also very important quarry species for fisheries throughout this range. And they use this hook and line and trawls to catch them. In Singali, um, Singalese waters, these guys will uh, mainly land their species in the local commercial fisheries, they'll like it. Overfishing is actually a threat for these guys in a lot of the areas, even where they are protected. And they have been targeted by poachers using lights and spear guns. And they luckily have been bred for aquaculture, and they're marketed fresh or preserved by smoking, so quite a common food fish, which is pretty cool. And um, yeah, they're considered least concerned, uh, I mean, they're threatened, I mean, so... Near threatened means there are some uh, effects on their population that could cause them to decline, but they seem to be doing quite well. They need to have some good monitoring. Really, really awesome little species, if I do say so myself. So, um, yeah. Next, we're moving on to another one done by uh, Leaf Buffsu and Chamsen9292, I believe. However you pronounce that. Uh, of course, all the names and uh, credits will go in the description. We've got here the Zone Tail Butterfly uh, Ray. Really, really awesome guys here. So um, I'm, we'll probably just wait a little bit for them to go in the water. Uh, let's just speed it up a little bit. Why not? We want to see them in their glory, don't we? Come on, get in the water. There we are. Really, really awesome little race here. Anyway, so these guys, uh, their scientific name is Ganura Zornora, how do you say that? Um, these guys in their uh, scientific name, or the entomology, that means naked tail. And uh, these guys are marine, so they're typically found in reefs and other associated areas, and they can get uh, found at depths between 28 to 37 meters. 
so that's quite deep and then tropical so they do like hanging out in tropical areas their range is typically the eastern indian ocean and the western central pacific so they can be found around Indo india to indonesia and then it includes places like singapore thailand etc and you can see here they're um quite big in terms of maturity they uh reach about 47.6 centimeters or 47 centimeters uh to add maturity and then they can get to a maximum length of about 106 centimeters and then the common length is about 20 centimeters for these guys in terms of their length but still really really awesome cool little fishies and not little they're quite big <laughs> these guys are uh, found inshore at shallow depths up to about at least 37 meters uh also found offshore they are offshore viviparous which means they can give birth to live young and the smallest individual was 27 centimeters wild caught and they're caught often by dimensional um, troll uh, or even gill nets which are very dangerous to marine life and occasionally use tangle nets they're often utilized for their meats but there's limited value because of their typically smaller size um, in terms of their life cycle they ex uh, show opo uh, viviparity which means they are aplacental um, basically live bearers bearers so basically the mother will keep the yolk in their body um, the embryos will have a yolk feed on the yolk and then once the yolk is um used up they will secrete a uterine milk uh, that is enriched with proteins and stuff like that to feed the babies inside the mother's body when then they are born uh, basically as little adults uh, like humans are uh really really interesting little guys and they actually have distinct pairing with a brace so they tend to pair up and then hug each other and make babies of course really really awesome i love the zone tail i like the different colors he's got you can see this one's a little bit more darker than this one over here we'll have a look just this one and have some variation too dissimilar from most other species of uh kind of stingrays things like that they are endangered though so they are considered endangered species because of obviously catching gill nets things like that habitat loss is another big thing um for these guys as well and they are considered venomous so you got to be very very careful so they remember one of these killed steve Irwin, not this particular species but stingrays did kill steve Irwin. so they've got a little barb at the end of their tail that is venomous so you got to be very careful uh, careful when hang hang uh catching and handling these guys kind of speak today weird but yeah very very awesome so again this was done by leaf buffs so and things charm Chanadin 9292 uh obviously i'll make sure everyone's credit in the description sometimes you just don't have enough space to write the name properly so i kind of just scribble that down so i apologize if i'm not verbally um congratulating you for helping out with this model but um anyway next we're going to move on to another really cool fish we're going back into the fresh water we've got ourselves the macon giant catfish a really really awesome big guys here it's done by gaboy uh buffsu and genora pizza so these guys, the Mekong giant catfish, they're a very large but sadly threatened species of catfish. They're native to the Mekong basin of the Southeast Asia and China and considered critically endangered for a few reasons that we'll get into. So you can see these guys are typically great white in color with, uh, but they lack stripes. They often have um, near total lack of barbels and absent teeth, but they are quite large as you can kind of see here with some spots. The unconfirmed length of about three meters on oh, 9.8 feet and they can grow extremely quickly and they reach about 200 kilograms or 440 pounds in six years and they've been reported to get up to 350 kilograms or about 770 pounds but the largest recorded one being a female that was 2.7 meters or 8 feet 10 inches and weighed about 2,903 kilograms or 696 pounds and was actually widely recognized as the largest freshwater fish until 2002 um, in 2022, uh, there was a giant freshwater stingray found in Cambodia that was heavier. So that's really, really interesting. I only just recently lost their title. So these guys are threatened species from the Mekong River Basins, and they often are considered a flagship species for conservationists and try and get people to care about the Mekong and preserve it. Historically, these guys had quite a large range. They ranged from the lower Mekong in Vietnam. They also range into the northern reaches of the river in the Yunnan province in China, spanning the entire 4,800 kilometers of the river. But due to threats, the species no longer habits the majority of this habitat, and now there is only believed to be isolated populations in the middle of the Mekong River. Typically, fish will congregate uh, during the beginning of the raining season and migrate kind of like upstream to spawn. They live primarily in the main channels of the river and with water depths being over 10 meters. And while um, researchers, fishermen have occasionally found these species in kind of lakes and rivers and stuff like that, and, and a lot of the territories as well. 
but there's no really been no sightings of them recently out of sight of the Mekong River just because they're so endangered. Um, but understanding the understanding of their migration is not very complete. They're thought to have reared primarily in the Tole Sap Lakes in Cambodian Mekong, and they migrate hundreds of miles north from the spawning grounds in Thailand. And the spawning fish in Upper Cambodia are being over-harvested, which obviously affects the whole population. And fragmentation because of dams have becoming increasingly common and has reduced the um, fish to breed and reduced their breeding abilities. Other big threats have been overfishing, destruction of spawning and breeding grounds, uh, damming, and these guys have really taken a toll on the species, and hence why they're considered critically endangered. So, in terms of feeding, as fry, these guys will feed on zooplankton in the river, and they've actually been known to be cannibalistic as babies, but after about a year or so, they begin to become herbivorous, so they feed on filamentous algae, and they potentially will also eat larvae, things like that. Um, the fish is likely to obtain its food from algae growing on uh, the submerged rocky uh, surfaces, and they do not have any sort of dentition, so they've basically got no teeth, as you can see, it's just no teeth there. <laughs> and the Mekong giant catfish are toothless herbivores that live off the plants and algae in the river. And one sci uh, scientific study found that zooplankton uh, and phytoplankton uh, and their stomach contents. So in terms of their captivity, they're now successfully bred in captivity in Thailand, though they're often hybridized with species such as the iridescent shark and stuff like that for the aquarium trade. And they've actually been... Um, restricted in various uh, states of Australia because they could be an invasive species in Australia. As a sport fish, these guys are common sport fish for exotic uh, fishing ponds in Thailand and Malaysia because they're giant size and they also put on a strong fight once they're hooked. In terms of the conservation though, they're endemic to the lower half of the Mekong. Kong, they're in danger of extinction because of water quality, uh, damming, overfishing, things like that, and it's why considered critically endangered. Uh, fishing of them is illegal in the wild though and there have been bans, but um, there have been lots of efforts trying to protect them. And also over harvest has been a big issue every year with millions of tons of fish being harvested from Cambodia each year. And also lots of other factors, damming, like water um, quality has really been affecting these fish. And being so big, they need a lot to survive. But hopefully they're doing okay. We've got them breeding in captivity if we needed to. We just need to help protect the Mekong and the Mekong will protect the uh, giant catfish. We just need to protect those rivers because freshwater rivers are extremely important and they hold such wonderful species like the Mekong catfish. A really, really awesome uh, animal. I really love talking about animals like this, especially critically endangered ones. I like educating about animals like that. I've got a soft spot for endangered species because it's sad to see them that way. But really, really beautiful animals to make on giant catfish. So wonderful, wonderful animals. So we're going to be moving back into the ocean. So this one was done by Leaf, Buff Su, and... Nisasa Beric, I believe you say that, however it is. We have got the orange catfish, uh, not catfish, clownfish. Little clownfish here. So these guys, also known as the Pakuya clownfish, or the clown and enemy fish, uh, these guys are a widely popular species of aquarium fish. Like other clownfish, they will live in close associations with anemones, so they're typically found in anemones that uh, they hide in them for protection, uh, similar to a lot of other species. And... Um, They'll also um, just help each other's symbiotic relationship. And they're quite hard to keep in captivity, but the symbiosis with these guys means uh, they've kind of... They pro the anemone protects them from um, chemicals. I mean, not chemicals. Protects them from bigger fish like uh, rats and things like that. Protects them from predators. And the fish will help the anemone by feeding it, moving around and increases the oxidization of it. So more oxygen gets into the anemone and um, they remove waste material from its host so it's a symbiotic relationship which is pretty cool so these guys in size they tend to get about 11 centimeters or about 4.3 inches and about average at about eight centimeters and they can be recognized by these three white long lines across the orange body as you can kind of see here with no distinct coloration between the sexes they look quite similar to the um, species the oscillaris clownfish which is the one that was Nemo, but these guys are quite a close relative, but look quite similar. But the easiest, easiest way to distinguish the two species is that um, the A. pinnaclura, so this one, has 10 spines on its first dorsal fin, but the other species has uh, 11, or really 10, and is more reliable. But mostly the more reliable way is to um, look at the color patterns. So the um, typically A. oscillaris does not have thick bandings, uh, outlining the fins so they wouldn't have this area kind of here 
So this is the kind of the easiest way to tell them apart from their close relative, the uh, Oclurus clownfish. Uh, in terms of reproduction, these fish uh, live in warm water, so they can breed all year round. Each group consists of a breeding pair, and none of them four non-breeders. Uh, they each have a hierarchy, with the female being the largest, the breeding male being the second largest, and the male non-breeders getting progressively smaller as the hierarchy descends. So they exhibit parandry, so that means each fish is born male, but they change... Uh, but changes to the female if the sole breeding female dies. So what will happen is that the if the female dies, the next largest breeding male will become the breeding female, and the largest non-breeder becomes the uh, breeding male. So it kind of circles through. And they typically spawn in correlation to the lunar cycle. So at night, the moon maintains a high level of alertness in these guys, and then they'll breed during that time. And then uh, the courtship would involve them extruding their fins and then biting the female and chasing her. And they also swim rapidly to attract females. And the nest site is also important for the survival of the eggs. And depending on her size, the female lays between 400 and 1500 uh, eggs per cycle. And they expanded to um, 10 of the breeding females roughly 12 years. And they're actually relatively long for a fish of this size, uh, which is pretty cool. So... The young breeders kind of just help and uh, hang out around the nest and help take care of the babies that the breeding pair kind of produce, which is pretty wild. And they typically lay their eggs on a safe spot close to the anemone where they're easily protected, and such as the parents can retain uh, safely if threatened. And the anemone is usually lazy. Anemone uh, fish usually lay their uh, nests in the evening, a few days after carefully cleaning the chosen site, things like that. An also very awesome thing is that recruitment and other individuals in a given species is that can survive within a certain time follow larva habituation. So the highest level of recruitment, the better chances of larvae surviving long enough to become adult fish. So they have large food supplies, low predator threat, and the available of nearby anemones often affects this. And Apicura, like most other common reef fish, have a bipartial life cycle. So typically as babies, they will live out in the ocean. And then they'll remain motionless, just go with the currents. Until they get big enough, they move into the um, reefs and then find an enemy and live in there. As adults, they're quite poor swimmers comparatively. So typically their habitat, they are typically found more across coral reefs. They can be found in the Pacific Indian Ocean off North uh, Western uh, Australia, Southeast Asia and Japan. And they both um, Apicura and then enemies reside in shallow waters where they like to live in waters between 25 to 28 degrees. They also um, develop quite fast as the eggs are fertilized. They tend to hatch about up to six to seven days. After hatching, the larvae are very small and drift out into the ocean, uh, and they stay in the upper water column. They spend about a week floating among the plankton and transported by currents, and the larval stage ends with them when they're still at the bottom of the ocean, and then the process from going from larval to juvenile stage takes about a day. The rapid... Um, development or color of these guys occurs during that juvenile stage and then during that juvenile stage an enemy fish has to find an suitable host and then they typically when it comes to contact with the anemone they produce a protective mucus like coat that protects them from the stings of the anemone which is really really cool and it's cool like symbiotic relationship that a lot of these anemone fish or clownfish have to um the reefs and things like that so really really awesome little fish little uh, guy is there only one in here is there four there should be four let's see if we can find the other ones oh there's one yeah really really cool little fishies how can i love these little guys not love little orange clownfish not the same type as nemo different species but uh obviously most people aren't too worried about that but next we went on to the blue sturgeon fish also known as the blue tang or the royal blue tang uh very interesting species this was dory if you know from uh your favorite uh, movie finding nemo as we talk about it really really awesome species here so these guys are quite a popular fish in marine aquaria so you can see they have this kind of really cool color to them like a royal blue body with that yellow tail and this palette design as you can kind of see here they get quite big they grow about 30 centimeters or 12 inches with adults typically weighing about 600 grams and males being generally larger than females this fish is rather flat, from like a pancake, and they've got quite that circular body, as you can kind of see here, and the small scales. In terms of their location, they're typically found in the Indo-Pacific, so they can be found in reefs in the Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, New Caledonia, Samoa, East Africa, and Sri Lanka. And they're actually one of the most common and most popular marine fish in the world because of um, Finding Nemo. And they tend to live in pairs or small groups of about 8 to 14 individuals. And they can be found near cauliflower corals and on the seaweed side of coral reefs, typically. 
And they can set least concern, uh, but of as low vulnerability, so interesting. As terms of di uh, diet, these guys are typically, um, the diet typically consists of plankton, with adults being omnivores. So they typically uh, grow off from plankton and become omnivores as they grow up. And they feed on plankton as well as algae. Uh, spawning will typically take place in the late afternoon and evening hours. And this event is indicated by a change of color as they change from, this uni uh, change from a uniform dark blue to a pale blue. And the fish is important for coral health because they eat algae that actually may um, overchoke the corals. Um, so these are very important for coral health, which is interesting. So in terms of life cycle, the uh, males aggressively caught the females uh, in the school, uh, leaning like kind of rushing them and stuff. They lay small eggs, approximately about 0.8 millimeters, and they're pelagic eggs, and then they have um, each contain a single droplet of oil to help them float. The fertilized eggs will hatch after 24 hours and reveals these small larvae that will often just drift in the current. The ones so opaque, the black pattern of the juveniles does not come in until they're fully mature and they reach sexual maturity at about 9 to 12 months of age. So these guys, in terms of human uh, interaction, these guys are a minor communal fish and uh, commercial fish importance. They are a bait fish. They have a strong odor, not highly prized, but they're often more commonly uh, caught for the aquarium trade. And they don't really do well in captivity. No one's ever really bred them in captivity yet. So most um, um, r blue tangs are kind of collected from the wild. And that's kind of an issue because of um, being the most popular fish. They're, lots of populations are at risk from uh, over-exploitation because of the aquarium trade and then also destructive fishing practices. But um, they seem to be doing okay in that regard. And there have been efforts to breed the species. Hopefully they're... Con um, they were successfully bred first in 2016 after an effort by Kevin Brandon and the Rising Tide Conservation. So it hopefully becomes more common to get captive bred blue tang in captivity. And in terms of popular culture, this is the species that um, Dory was and that she was voiced by Alan DeGeneres. Um, very, very cool fish. I do love blue tangs. It's really nice to see them in aquariums. Really, really do love them. So yeah, really awesome fish. Um, so... It's all done all the fish today. This one was done by Leaf Buff Suit and Bronze 82 or 282, I think it is. Uh, next, moving on to our last uh, animal for today. This one is a remake by Bongo Hardwood. We got ourselves the Magpie Goose. Really, really cool animal here. So the Magpie Goose, they're actually not related to Goose that closely. They're actually their own group that like arrived during the uh, end of the Ice Age. Uh, not the Ice Age, um, the... They diverged from other species before the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event, or the KPG, with a relative living about 68, 67 million years ago in, like, um, USA, or London Clay, and plus, like, places like that. So they're, like, really early relatives of the, um, or really um, early branch of kind of birds, which is really, really interesting. Um, there have been relatives found around, like, the Paleogene and Oligocene in Europe and areas in France and things like that. But these guys um, typically just now survive as Australia, and they're the last member of their group. Um, as you can see, they're quite a different um, color to these guys. So these guys are unmistakable because they have this black and white plumage, as you can kind of see here, with um, yellowish legs that are webbed. Uh, pa only partially webbed, though. And they typically feed on vegetal, uh, vegetable material in the water, as well as on land. Males are typically a little bit larger than the females. So the males are a little bit bigger, but they do molt gradually. So they don't have a flightless period and they've got a loud honk very similar to most other goose type animals, things like that. So in terms of their ecology, these guys are typically found in open wetland areas such as floodplains, swamps, areas like that. And also grass seeds, they feed on wild rice, things like that. They're fairly sedentary apart from some movement during the dry season. They're also colonial breeders and are gregarious outside of the breeding season. So they... Um, Typically form large and noisy flocks that can be up to a few thousand individuals. The nest on the ground uh, or a tree is five meters or more so tall. And they typically lay a clutch between five to 14 eggs. So we'll have a look at the cute little babies as we talk about that. I'll give these little guys. So um, some males mate with two females, all of which raise their young, unlike some other polygamous birds. And there may be benefit when predation of young is high and chicks are raised by trees more likely to survive. So these guys are typically plentiful across most of their range, although it's significantly reduced in comparison to um, when Europe, after Europeans came. So their range was extended from pretty much South uh, Australia up to Southern Australia, Western Victoria. But for now, they're mainly restricted more North 
uh, especially due to overhunting, uh, overhunting and habitat destruction. A lot of those populations more south were extirpated by the mid 20th century. But there are efforts to reintroduce them, such as um, the Bola Regrut and Narrow Court kind of uh, reintroductions, which is all very good. You want to get these guys back in common again in the southern areas. The magpie goose was listed as near threatened by the two in 2007. And I believe now they are considered least concerns, but um, there's still obviously reintroduction plans, as I mentioned, trying to get them back out into um, southern parts of Australia, like Narrow Court, places like that. And um, with the advent of climate change and more sequent um, seawater like inundations of current freshwater floodplains, it's believed that these populations be may be at risk. So it's kind of a do we really want to call them? Uh, least concerned when that could be a risk to them but they seem to be doing okay now at least and quite important in aboriginal culture so there's actually uh they know the bird is the maramulek i believe you say that or uh, however i probably butchered that but anyway they were quite an important food item for the uh with the formation of these wetlands about uh 1500 years ago and often depicted as in rock art and things like that and often been people have them holding feathers and goose feather fans things like that so really really cool I do love the species. I really I love the magpie goose. You can see the difference with the male here. The male's kind of got this big crest going on here, and the feet. Is that, that should be a fe no, male. Females are a little bit more dainty. Uh, they don't quite have that big crest, but still really really awesome. So um, yeah. They're done by Bungo Hardwood. Really does. I love Bungo Hardwood's birds, and really does a wonderful job with mods. Anytime you get a Bungo mod, it's always a treat. But anyway, I think this will be a great time to end this video. So um. I um, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.